uh, but we just thought that this would be a good time to get um, have a lot of updates on what's happening. So the first person we have is uh, Congressman Ed Case. Congressman Thank Case, you. thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and aloha to everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me on for a few minutes of a quick update. Um, obviously, American Rescue Plan just passed 1.9 trillion. Um, you all are, um, I think, pretty pretty familiar with the basics of, of the American Rescue Plan, state and local government funding at 2.2 billion, uh, further federal unemployment uh, benefits, uh, additional stimulus payments that are already being received, um, additional help to our uh, business communities, especially small business. Um, and I would note here that um, the PPP program continues to be pretty strong. In the first um, two and a half uh, months of this year, we've seen another uh, roughly 12,000 uh, small business loans at about 1.1 billion of funding here in Hawaii. So that continues to be a strong point. Um, help for our vaccinations, education, and on. We can expect at the end of the day to see uh, um, six billion plus uh, come into Hawaii, probably more than that from, from the American Rescue Plan to go with. Uh, the CARES Act funding from a year ago now, um, which is uh, still still coming into Hawaii, it's now around 11 billion, as well as the $900 billion uh, supplemental that we passed in December, uh, which is still coming in as well. Uh, we also have some some uh, uh, specific programs that have not come in yet that will make a contribution uh, from the American Rescue Plan and the prior one. The one is the Restaurants Act, which is focused uh, assistance to our restaurant uh, oriented businesses, which will be very helpful here in Hawaii. And then another program called the Shuttered Venue uh, Operators, uh, which was a targeted uh, um, um, assistance to our entertainment industry essentially. Um, that has had a slow start, but should kick in uh, shortly. So we'll have some very targeted industry support, especially to travel and tourism. Um, the other areas I wanna cover very quickly with you, next up for us in Congress is infrastructure, uh, one to $2 trillion worth of an infrastructure package, which uh, we, should, we should take full advantage of uh, here in Hawaii. Um, your congressional delegation is very focused on this. Uh, we have very good placement on the committees of jurisdiction. Um, and so we, we are already talking with each and all of, uh, uh, of our governments uh, about uh, what kind of infrastructure we can uh, fund. That's obviously gonna also be uh, tremendous uh, for, for stabilizing and, and our economy as we come through COVID-19. And then finally, we're into the uh, regular process of appropriations uh, for the year, especially Senator Schatz and I on the Senate and House committees on, on appropriations are, are very much involved in that at this moment. So we're uh, talking with everybody about where we can uh, kick in uh, from, from that perspective. This is for the uh, fiscal year that starts in October, but it takes a, a while for us to, to get that all in place. So short-term American Rescue Plan, midterm infrastructure, long-term uh, back to uh, regular appropriations as we go through. That's our that's our plan to uh, try to contribute um, to, to um, uh, navigating uh, through the crisis. Um, and we are um, all available to answer your questions. Okay, thanks, Congressman. I think there might be some questions right now. Are there any questions or comments for Congressman? Any questions? Yes, Pamela. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Congressman Case. For I can't really hear you, Pamela. Sorry, you went, you went mute. There we go. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you, Congressman Case, for being here with us today. You know, we were uh, thrilled to hear about the Shuttered Venue Program, which is an awesome program, and of course, the restaurant program is phenomenal for us all. But we find that we have many wedding planners and huge event planners whose business has also tanked during this time. And because they're not a shuttered venue, these are companies that do major events for corporate event planners as well as major weddings. So they haven't really seen any relief um, other than the loan programs, and yet their businesses have lost tremendous amounts of revenue. I'm just wondering if there's anything in the works or that could be in the works to help those companies. Well, I think you know the the the, the reality is that um, we started we started and continue with a very very broad brush, uh, especially relating to um, small businesses uh, with PPP that they should be eligible for either that or idle 
and or both. And so that would be the number one go-to. Now, there have been other um, industries, as, as I already pointed out, that uh, did succeed in Congress on a broad basis in getting more targeted support. I don't know enough about the wedding planning business to know whether it might fit into some of the specific programs that um, are, are more industry specific with with um, with the American Rescue Plan, I'd be happy to find out. So if you could have them contact me, we'll at least ask. It's possible that those questions, those, those industries, could be shoehorned in into some of these. But um, um, if not, um, I, I think the the honest answer to your question is that that we're probably not going to go back to this uh, particular, um, uh, you know, the American Rescue Plan style approach, it's possible that we would have some tailored stuff. Uh, the airlines is another one where I see Peter's on the phone. We've had some tailored assistance there. So if if they're not there now, or if we can't get them into them, it's going to have to be probably on the basis of the, the general PPP idle programs with small business for now. Thank you. Yes, they've been taking advantage of those, but um, I will reach out and we'll send you some data to see if there is in any way we can find a way to include them in the shuttered venue program. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pamela. Are there any other, other questions or comments for Congressman? Uh, okay, speaker, I, I have a question yeah. um, for, for Peter. Um, first of all, Congressman, thank you for your hard work and, and for joining us this morning. Um, I have a, I have a yeah. comment question similar to Pam's on the two entertainment and restaurant uh, specific know. programs. Um, we've, we've had a couple of customers who are um, dinner cruises who kind of, as you think about it, kind of fall in between those two programs, wondering if they might um, might qualify. And it's been, frankly, a bit murky. So whatever help your office can help uh, in providing, you know, just clarity at least, uh, would be much appreciated. Well, the the, the bottom line is that uh, that we really want to try to help businesses that are that are that don't exactly fit the the um, the profile in, in the law. There is some flexibility at the administrative level as they're putting together guidance for these programs. And so, but once that guidance locks down, it's harder to change. So, you know, especially as American Rescue Plan is rolling out right now, the restaurant uh, part of it, for example, there's still some, some discretionary decisions to be made at the, at the, at the administrative level um, that um, we, need to, we need to know about right now so that we can weigh in right now. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. It's, it's Wendy Laros with the mm -hmm. Conococcola Chamber of yes. Commerce. Yes, Wendy. Thank you. Um, so, Congressman Case, about the the small business help and the PPP loans, the deadline was is right now March thirty first. Is that deadline now extended through the American Rescue Plan? It was not extended to the American Rescue Plan for some arcane reasons that have to do with the use of reconciliation for that plan uh, that it'll take me an hour to explain. But the bottom line is that um, um, we passed a standalone bill just last week in Congress to extend that deadline out to June 30th. I suspect that the Senate will pass it uh, fairly expeditiously and there will be an extension. But I, I don't know as I sit here today exactly where the Senate is with that bill. I think you will know. I think you will know um, in the next, um, you know, week, which is cutting it close. Um, but um, nonetheless, I, 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 I hope and believe that it will be extended. Thank what was the extension date in the House version? June thirtieth, I believe. Okay. All right. Any other questions? <clears throat> if not, thank you very much, Congressman. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. Okay, so that's a good segue to the next presenter, Carl, Carl Bonham. Um, we're an update on Hawaii's economy. Carl. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm, you know, since it's been forever since we've met, and so there's a there's a lot to cover, but I'll I'll try and keep it keep it fairly brief. Uh, both Uhiro and DBED released forecasts uh, in the last month or so. Uh, our the title of our forecast was more substantial recovery in sight. And you know, we're already we're already working on the next forecast and uh, and raising that forecast even further. So it's nice to be sort of optimistic for a change. And some of that optimism comes from, uh, it certainly doesn't come from looking backwards, which is where I'll start. So if you look at, these are unemployment rates on the horizontal axis, and we're looking at 
Hawaii's unemployment rate as of January 2021 of 10.2% and an increase year over year of eight percentage points. The, the, so 67,000 people remain unemployed in Hawaii on the, um, in the labor market data. The next closest in terms of unemployment rates are, are California, New Mexico. California has an unemployment rate of 9% and an increase year over year increase of, of only 4.8%. So Hawaii went from 2% unemployment in January of 2020 to 10.2% in January of 2021. So we, we obviously have a long ways to go still uh, and continuing that, that look backwards, but now a, a comparison to the US average. You know, there, so despite what the preliminary data suggested uh, that some sectors in Hawaii were actually adding jobs, none of the major sectors that we track uh, in Hawaii added jobs last year with the exception of federal government. And the federal, it was a census year in 2020. And so there was, there was some census hiring that contributed to that. Um, the closest thing to, to adding jobs was finance and insurance. Uh, every, every other sector had percentage job losses that were in many cases more than double the percentage job losses for the US, whether it was you know, accommodations and food services where the job losses nationally were 18% in Hawaii, they were 39%. Transportation, the job losses nationally were 2%. In Hawaii, they were 23%. Real estate nationally, 4%. Hawaii, almost 20%. And if you, I think, I think I've heard uh, people tell me I don't cover enough of the neighbor island content on, on some of these updates. So I, I included that on this, uh, in, in this presentation. And it's really, as you would expect with Maui and Kauai hurt, uh, hurt the most uh, by far with the, the higher concentration of tourism and the, the more diversified economies on, on Oahu and on the big island. And it, so the picture is really just as you would expect um, with overall job losses that the first column there is, is non-farm uh, payroll jobs. So overall job losses, this is for the, for the whole year uh, at almost 30% on Maui, almost 28% on Maui and 22% and on Kauai. The good news of course, is that we've really been in incredibly successful with the Safe Travels program. Uh, you know, it was, it was uh, very well thought out, well planned out. Uh, and when it launched, uh, right before it launched, we were averaging almost 97 cases statewide a day with an almost 3% positivity rate. And this data is a little bit dated. So these numbers would be higher because of the, the end of last week uh, increasing case counts. But as of March 15th, we were at 53 cases a day and a 1.1% positivity. And the, the vaccination numbers, uh, of course, that's a, a, a real incredible success story and ongoing. But we're, uh, from the, the data that I have available, I show that we, uh, we've surpassed 610,000 vaccines statewide, and almost 28% of the population has received at least one shot. Um, we're, we're running about 11,000, uh, average of um, about 11,000 vaccines uh, per, per day. And if we were to continue at that pace, in about four months, we would have reached 75% of the population, assuming that we that we actually reach all of those population, right? There's still challenges in reaching some of the underserved, uh, underserved populations, and you know we will eventually start to uh, run up against uh, vaccine reluctance, and that that's something that we really have to 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 pay attention to. And you know the the question is is you know when are we going to hear about the upgrades to the Safe Travels program? When are we going to have an official um, proclamation, an official announcement uh, that People can plan around. They can plan for summer travel. Um, they, you know, they can make decisions about whether they're going to come to Hawaii in June and July or go somewhere else because they're uncertain about the the prospects of coming to Hawaii and having to get tested, even though they've been vaccinated. So the the numbers on tourism have really been been uh, very very good. The these are weekly data. So um, for March, we're we're averaging over twelve thousand visitors a day. Uh, that's the daily average through, I think, the 21st. 
Um, so each the the weekly numbers is what I'm showing here, and so um, so we're at roughly 40 percent from March. We'll probably end the in the month at 40 to 41 percent of 2019 visitor arrival numbers. And so the the on the current trajectory, this really looks a lot like the optimistic scenario that we released uh, it just three or four weeks ago in our in our last forecast report. Uh, and so that's a sense in which, uh, even though that was a uh, very upbeat forecast report. The next one, next one's likely to be even more upbeat, and it's it's coming from a combination. In fact, it's coming from that strong tourism. Um, it's coming from the American Rescue Plan, which um, Representative Case already spoke about in, in great length. I our estimates are that we're going to see well over six billion dollars. Um, it won't surprise me if Hawaii sees between seven and eight billion dollars in in support. Uh, from direct payments to households and tax credits of over $2 billion. There's over $2 billion in the support to state and county government. Um, some of the differences would be in estimates of how much we'll, we will receive in enhanced unemployment benefits. And of course, that depends on your estimates of the unemployed and, and people who are eligible. Uh, there's close to $200 million in renter homeowner uh, assistance. Uh, really, this is an extremely important piece. And we're sort of finally in a situation where we, we probably have enough resources there to really make a difference. Um, and then Representative Case talked about the, the ongoing small business and the, the shuttered venue operators. And then there's direct aid to K through 12, uh, to the universities, and importantly, to uh, support childcare. So all of that is having an enormous impact, a very imp important critical impact on our forecast, the, the blue line here is the forecast that uh, we released just a few weeks ago where we were estimating the effects of the, of the American Rescue Plan. And the gold line was what we had released in the fourth quarter with no American Rescue Plan. And so income would have fallen uh, in 2021 because the, all the federal support was, was set to end after the, the December bill would have eventually run out. And we would have been left with just the job losses pulling income down. With the American Rescue Plan, income, total real income in the state doesn't fall back to 2019 levels anywhere during the forecast period. And if you look at what it does to our GDP forecast, it gets the GDP, it moves the GDP recovery uh, to 2019 levels to roughly the second, third quarter um, of 2022. And so it's, uh, Thank you, Representative Case, and uh, it's, a, it's a really important uh, contribution to, to moving Hawaii's economy forward while we continue to wait for the more complete recovery of tourism. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Carl or comments? I have a question. Yes, sir, Bonishi. Yeah, Carl, can you go back to that income chart? Uh, I can, um, if I can find my Zoom again. So 2019 is what about right. 81 million? So does that, take into account the entire economy and all the income generated so, by everyone, including unemployment, et cetera? Uh, so this is personal income, right? So it's not, it's not GDP. So it's not everything we produce, but it is all of the income that's earned in the economy. And it does include unemployment benefits. So that's, I mean, essentially, so the 2019 level at about 82 billion, right? So this is in millions. Mm -hmm. um, of current dollars, excuse me, in, in uh, constant dollars. So we've deflated it using the Honolulu Consumer Price Index. Um, and then this surge in 2020 is the result of the CARES Act, right? So it's, it's the plus up unemployment benefits. It's the, uh, it's the regular unemployment benefits, the plus up unemployment benefits, the transfer payments, the, the direct payments to households, right? The $1,200. Um, and then, um, and then you get in, in 2021, you get the, the bill from December with the $600 payments. It also includes um, PPP loans, 
that have been that are being counted as income because they're being they're being treated as grants, right? They're they're being forgiven and being treated as income by the by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And so then what happens is in in 2022, uh, essentially that wanes, right? It's these programs end after 2021, and in 2022 we fall back to uh, roughly the where we would have been if we had had just sort of continued to grow from 2019 on. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions or comments for Carl? Speaker Della Rebelotti. Yes, it's Rebelotti. Uh, just a quick question. So, Carl, it's so great to have some optimistic news, <laughs> but for us as policymakers and thought leaders, uh, what are some of your suggestions on how we can continue to use this opportunity to ensure resilience? Are there are there traps that we should be avoiding or are there focus areas we need to hone in on um, as we continue uh, to look at how we rebuild basically coming out of the pandemic? So I don't think that my um, any of my suggestions would change yet at this point. Uh, and, and those suggestions have consistently been the number one thing is public health, right? So the, the, the number one thing that can derail us at this point uh, is a surge in cases with the new variants um, that that slows the progress on tourism. And the the other thing that um, basically in the, over the next year, the number one issue is still bringing tourism back because that's what brings the jobs back. It, and I'm talking about in the very in the very near term. Um, that's what brings the jobs back and brings the tax revenues back. Um, and th then the the other thing that we've talked a lot about is infrastructure spending and uh, s protecting uh, crucial services, right? And I know you're already working on this, protecting both public health, but also education, um, investing in infrastructure and the, the, the infrastructure money that, that, so we're already building in an expectation of federal, uh, federal support for, for construction uh, or for infrastructure spending in uh, 2022 and, and beyond. Uh, and focusing some of that on, on the you know sort of the obvious things of, of transportation and schools and housing, um, and, but climate change uh, as well. So those that gets you a little a little bit longer term. Um, but the the thing that I think we really need to focus on is that uh, tourism, bringing tourism back uh, as far as we can while protecting our people and our environment is number one priority. And, and you know, and then we're the, we are in the process of there's a lot of work going on uh, at DBED with with um, there's work behind the scenes on Hawaii 2.0 that will start coming coming forward, uh, and we're going to be releasing a uh, uh, hero brief in in coming weeks on diversifying Hawaii's economy. So there's there's a lot of things that we can work on, um, but it, in the very near term, it's really about public health and tourism. Okay, thanks. Are there more questions or comments? I thought that's a good segue to the next topic. Um, so Representative Linda Ichiyama chairs our House Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Committee, and she's been working really hard this session, as you can imagine. Um, so she has an update for us this morning. Rep Ichiyama. Thank you, Speaker. Um, just a real quick update on some bills that are currently moving through the legislature. Um, for those of you who may not follow us as closely, we just completed crossover where all of the House bills cross over the Senate, Senate bills cross over to the House, so the House is currently hearing Senate bills. Um, an update on the Safe Travels Bill, House Bill 1286 will be heard in the Senate today at 3 p.m. Um, the language from House Bill 1286 has also been inserted into Senate Bill 266, so we have two different vehicles. Um, Senate Bill 266 is now moving to the Committee on Finance. Um, a real quick update on the face mask mandate. Unfortunately, that bill did not make it. However, we are looking at um, how, um, Senate Bill 540, which would accomplish kind of the same goal, which was to create more varied penalties for violations of emergency orders, right? So now that we can have a fine that you can pay online um, if you're um, in violation of the face mask mandate versus a full misdemeanor. 
So um, Senate Bill 540 is now moving to the House Committee on Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs. A brief update on vaccines. Um, the um, Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Committee has been holding regular informational briefings on vaccine implementation and rollout. We have tentatively scheduled another one for this Thursday at 9.30 a.m. with Department of Health. And we'll be asking them about their phase 1C rollout, as well as expansion of the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership, um, which um, has just recently expanded with CVS uh, opening up more locations. Um, and then finally, just to wrap up, we are starting to look at some of our um, interim work. Um, we passed House Concurrent Resolution 121, authored by Vice Chair Stacey Lynn Eli to create a task force on language and disability access during disasters, as well as House Concurrent Resolution 91 to create a resiliency health disaster task force um, to come up with a coordinated response plan, which is introduced by Representative Ty Cullen. I'm happy to take any questions or provide any other updates. Maybe if um, um, Rep. Chum, if, if um, Jill Green and um, Ray, Ray Vern, I couldn't make it, but Art Gladstone is here from HPH. If you folks could just give us an update on the vaccination centers at Pier 2 and um, Blaisdell. Absolutely. Happy to. Thank you. Happy to. Thank you. Uh, it's as health systems who are really honored to be a part of this process. Uh, clearly, last week, HPH and Queens both hit 100,000 doses uh, that have happened since the pandemic started. Uh, and that's just a start. Uh, both of us are deeply committed to as soon as we have enough vaccine to be putting 5,000 shots a day. Uh, so that and the rest of the community working together will be in a much better position. And as Carl said, uh, we all agree that public health right now is is key. We are in a vulnerable time. Uh, while we are one of, I think we're the seventh in the country for having the most individuals vaccinated with at least one dose. That's not enough to get through the variants that have already started. So we've got to make sure that people are still wearing their masks, make sure that we're keeping physical distance, distancing, and then as quickly as we can get vac vaccines on island, uh, we need to be putting them in people's arms. I'm very appreciative of the work that's happening with community health centers. Uh, they've done a nice job of making sure particularly vulnerable populations are getting access. Uh, for us here at Queens, we are opening up a second mass vaccination site at our hospital in West Oahu, because we recognize that the travel to come down to downtown Honolulu is far for many families. So we're starting that as of at tomorrow. Uh, we also have vans and several health systems are getting vans to make sure that we can go to smaller communities as we're invited to provide pop-up uh, pop services to make sure that we can get into areas that may not be as accessible. Uh, as uh, we would want them to be. Uh, I appreciate the creativity of all of the groups that are working together and um, look forward to, uh, I am very hopeful if our president is able to get us the vaccines that I anticipate we'll get in the next three to four weeks, that we are gonna be pushing hard through the next two to three months because uh, again, the variants are here and we want to stay ahead of having another um, increased surge. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, Art Gladstone, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you, okay. Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to be here representing Hawaii Pacific Health and Ray Vera today. As of Saturday, we are at 113,000 doses. Uh, operations at Pier 2 continue to be very smooth. Lots of great feedback from folks coming through on the efficiency of the operation, as well as how nice people are and, and kind as they're navigating their way through the pier. Uh, echoing Jill's thoughts, we are only limited by the amount of vaccine that we have and um, hope that our, our supply increases so we can continue to expand the number of vaccines that we're providing and getting shots into arms. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, are there any quest questions or comments? Peter, I have Peter, a uh, yes, go, Peter. Go ahead. I'll, I'll take the question, go ahead. 
it's, it's more of a concern that we have for retailers because we've noticed on a lot of the um, websites for people to um, get their vaccinations that retailers were not included in the list. And now we're also concerned that right now the state has said the pr priority is for hotel workers, restaurant staff and bar owners. Yet retailers from the beginning, we have been on the front line every day serving the public and yet we're pushed to the side and we're wondering why is that? Um, you know, we certainly don't wanna be a hot spot, and we're really concerned about especially our customers and our workers there. Um, but we're just kind of, we know that there's also a um, limited amount of supply of the vaccine, but you know, retailers are pretty important. We're the part of the economic engine here that's kind of stimulating the economy. And yet we don't wanna be um, pushed back. We wanna be sure that all of our people are healthy. Rapi Chiamma might have some uh, information on that. Um, so I think, Tina, it, it uh, comes down to whether or not um, uh, somebody who's working in retail is considered a frontline essential worker or an otherwise an essential worker. So some of your retailers actually might have qualified as a frontline essential worker, for example, right, hardware stores, um, grocery stores, those are the frontline essential workers that had to come in uh, within six feet of contact of members of the public. Um, and they were designated as critical infrastructure. Um, so they may have already been vaccinated in phase 1B. And now that we're in phase 1C with the rest of the essential workers, you're right, they have prioritized the restaurant and um, travel uh, industry. I know that they're trying to work through them as quickly as they can and also expand further. Um, there actually was an article, I think it was just yesterday in the Star Advertiser that talked about um, the very deliberative process that Hawaii is moving through with vaccination and how that's contributed to our success. So um, I certainly hear what you're saying and the concerns of your members, and we want to get to them as soon as possible. At the same time, we want to make sure that the distribution is working efficiently and safely. Thank you. <clears throat> so Tina, you know, just... Um, oh, can I just add this real fast? Rep Representative Ichiyama has been, has been working really... Um, diligently on this vaccination priority uh, priorities with um, the health department. So she's been, um, you know, she's spent a lot of time on this. Uh, Peter. Yeah, Speaker, I just wanted to put a shout out to uh, Art and to Jill and to Dr. Mugishi because I think that um, in large part of success is, is, is also driven by having uh, three, you know, homegrown, locally headquartered, large health systems that cooperated with each other. And just, just I just wanna thank and congratulate those three individuals for a job well done today. Okay, are there any uh, speak, questions? Speaker, yes. uh, this is Mufi. Um, yes, Mufi. I, I too would like to uh, acknowledge the, the strong support that we're getting from Queens, um, HPH, and uh, all the others that are involved with this. Um, and to Tina's point, uh, you know, we've been working very closely with uh, Deputy Director Kathy Ross to try to get through the hotel, restaurant, bar segment of the hospitality industry as quickly as possible so that we can move into areas, uh, as uh, Tina is indicating, the retail merchants and the likes. So the whole idea is to fold the whole hospitality industry, um, and that's a big tent, uh, as soon as possible. And the efficiency by which we're moving through, uh, I think, uh, could make that sooner rather than later. And I just wanted to acknowledge the support too of the Department of Health uh, and Kathy Ross. Okay, are there other questions or comments? Speaker, Rep. Onishi. Yes, Rep. Onishi. Yeah, I got two things. One is, you know, in these reports about the number of vaccinations, can we also get the number of people that have completed vac vaccinations? Because just knowing how many doses, when we say, half a million doses, it doesn't fully indicate exactly how many people have completed vaccination in the state. The other thing is we're not being provided any information about the neighbor islands and the, the issues and the, the, I guess, progress of neighbor islands. And there's been, I guess, over the past weekend, week, half a week or so, reports about Maui's slow rollout of vaccinations. 
and who's addressing those issues? So the Department of Health recently updated their vaccine administration dashboard, and they do show the number of doses um, uh, total as well as first and second dose. And they have that um, on their um, hawaiicovid19.com website, as well as on the DOCD website. Um, it's also broken out by age groups. You can compare the over 75 population to the 65 and over population. Last week, they also added um, breakouts by ethnicity, which I think is very helpful to make sure that we're reaching underserved communities. Um, as far as the vaccine rollout on Maui, there was some delay um, in inputting the vaccine information into VAMS. So Department of Health sent out a number of workers um, to help them um, improve their inputting and make sure that all the data is being recorded and updated accordingly. Um, they also had did some um, administrative changes to make sure that they were pushing out as many doses as possible and not trying to save any doses for a second time around. So Maui did actually, um, if, you, if you track their numbers week over week, has started to catch up with the rest of the neighbor islands. I certainly hear the concerns about um, communications, about vaccine pods and rollout on neighbor islands, and that's something that I've conveyed to the Department of Health myself personally. Are there other questions or comments? Any questions? Okay, if not, that's all that we had for today. Um, see, my only closing comment would be that um, I think we're, we're all going to have to be prepared for a potential surge in um, tourism, as you know, as Carl had discussed during his PowerPoint. Um, I think that the um, you know we just have to be prepared because the public, you know, the public. Um, you know, may have a response to a sudden surge. So um, that's something that I think we'll be focused on um, over for the next couple of months. Okay, so that's, Peter, do you have anything? No, no, no speaker. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining us. See you next time, thank you. Thank you.